I can think of no, uh, no one better on planet Earth uh, to be our inaugural seminar speaker uh, than uh, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, our guest uh, today. Uh, Ambassador Sherman is currently senior counsel counselor at the Albright Stonebridge Group and a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, specifically at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And in January uh, of next year, uh, Wendy will join uh, the faculty um, uh, at the Kennedy School as a professor of the practice in public leadership and uh, the director of the school's Center for Public Leadership. So that's very exciting uh, uh, for Harvard. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're great. <laughs> the weather's better here. Um, that is that is true. <laughs> uh, she's had an, a, an amazing career uh, as one of the nation's premier diplomats. I'm not going to go into every uh, detail of that career, but but let me mention a few things that are directly relevant, I think, to today's uh, discussion. Uh, from 2011 to 2015, uh, Ambassador Sherman served as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, which is the fourth-ranking official at the State Department. Uh, she led the U.S. negotiating team that reached uh, the agreement we'll be talking a lot about today, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, uh, better known as the Iran deal, uh, and uh, the, a deal between not just the United States and Iran, but between the P5 plus one, uh, the U.K., France, Germany, China, Russia, plus the EU, so it's kind of the Germany, P, 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 Germany uh, and, uh, and Iran, uh, and blessed by the US, U.N. Security Council, I should say. Um, uh, and among many other accomplishments uh, that she had during the uh, Obama administration. Uh, from uh, 1993 to 2001, Ambassador Sherman served uh, first as Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs under Secretary Warren Christopher, and then as Counselor of the Department of State under Secretary Madeleine Albright. And during this time, she also served as a Special Advisor to President Clinton and Policy Coordinator on North Korea, where she headed North Korean negotiations policy. Uh, Ambassador Sherman has recently published a book reflecting on her long experience with diplomacy and how those values can be applied inside and outside the negotiating room. The book is called Not for the Faint of Heart. Lessons encourage power and persistence, and copies can be found on the table outside. Uh, Wendy will be giving uh, a separate lecture on, on that book tonight here on Stanford, uh, Stanford's campus. Uh, the conversation today is uh, really meant to focus on uh, the Iran deal, uh, how we got to the Iran deal, where things may be going from here, and how the Iran deal fits into a broader strategy that the Trump administration appears to be pursuing in the region and what some of the consequences of that strategy might be. So it's a great way to kick off uh, this particular uh, series. In terms of format, uh, essentially, I'm going to talk with Wendy for about half of our time. Uh, we, have, we have 90 minutes in here, so we'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions uh, from the audience, and when we do that, um, I'll have maybe a few additional instructions. So, Wendy, welcome. Hi. Yeah, it's great to see you again. Um, so, you became the Undersecretary for Political Affairs of the State Department in 2011. Uh, tell us how you first became involved in the Iran negotiations around, around that time period. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'm really honored to be your first speaker for this series. I think it's a really, really important series. I'd like to listen to all the rest of them so I can understand what's going on in the Middle East. Um, I uh, want to thank you, Colin, in particular. You all should know we're going to talk about Iran today, and Colin was very much a part of developing the strategy around Iran. Uh, people tend to think of the Iran deal as President Obama, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz, all of which is true and occasionally even about me, uh, but there was a core negotiating team of 15 people, uh, including uh, Jim Timby, who's often here on campus, uh, who really led on the nuclear side, and hundreds of people in the U.S. government, uh, and certainly Colin in the role he played at the White House uh, was essential. I also want to acknowledge that we're sitting in uh, the Bill Perry room, and I'm really honored Deborah's here today, who's really part of the original um, preventive defense team. Uh, and lots of what I learned, I learned from Bill Perry uh, in North Korean negotiations. You can read about that in the book. And so I'm really honored to be here, uh, to be here with my friend Sig Hecker, who can teach all of us everything there is to know about <laughs> nuclear power. Uh, and Mike McFall, who is now uh, really high on the Russiaphobe list. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> really, some things are a badge of honor, you know, and um, was also instrumental because Russia was obviously a very important part of what we did in the Iran negotiation. And there are lots of other people sprinkled through here that I've seen during the day, uh, Alan and, and others that uh, have been part of my past, and 
I hope future as well, and I thank you for all that you do out at Stanford. I consider Stanford and Harvard to be, you know, folks who talk to each other and should be doing more and more together. Uh, I hope the day comes when, and this already exists for some students, where students come to Harvard for one semester or one year and get a sense of the transatlantic relationship and looking east, and then they spend a semester or a year out in Stanford looking uh, west to Asia uh, and get a sense of really where the world is headed. So I don't see us as competitors. I see us as people who really ought to help students understand how vast the world is and how much work there is to be done. So with that, <laughs> to answer your question, how I got involved in all this insanity, um, the Undersecretary for Political Affairs in the State Department is the political director of the United States. And the P5 plus 1 negotiations were done at the political director level. So it wasn't about me, it was about the role I had. Uh, and uh, early on, I went to see Bill Burns, who had become Deputy Secretary of State and was an old friend and colleague from the Clinton days. And I said, are you sure you don't want to hold on to the Iran portfolio? And he said, with a great smile on his face, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Little did he know that he was going to be pulled back into the Iran negotiations to head up the secret channel. Uh, and I'm, I'm very glad that he took that on. And together, I think, along with all these hundreds of other people, Jake Sullivan, who was critical to that secret channel, um, got us where we are. But my first encounter with Iran as a country really came uh, the second week I was undersecretary. In the most strange and bizarre way, I had been at the uh, high-level week of the United Nations uh, was my first week as undersecretary, what we call diplomatic speed dating. <laughs> For those of you who haven't had the lovely opportunity of going from 7.30 in the morning till midnight in half an hour segments seeing everyone in the world, um, I came back to the State Department. No sooner had I got to my office for the first time than I got a call from the FBI that they had picked up at John F. Kennedy Airport uh, a guy named Arbopsiar who had traveled through Mexico to the United States, and it appears there had been a plot to uh, blow up the Saudi ambassador at Cafe Milano, a very popular restaurant in Georgetown, which of course would have been catastrophic. Um, and um, so all of a sudden I was plunged into learning everything there was to learn about Iran. I called in uh, the intelligence and research group. I sort of schooled myself as quickly as I could. I had to get talking points out to every embassy to get them to go in at the highest level and condemn what the Iranians were going to do. Uh, and uh, we ended up getting a UN General Assembly resolution uh, condemning uh, Iran for this action. Um, it, it was really quite an extraordinary uh, entry point. Uh, and then, of course, I became the person who got engaged uh, in the actual negotiations, which for the first two years were painful under Ahmadinejad and uh, uh, painful but more productive uh, during uh, Rouhani's term. Why don't I stop there? Well, great. So I wonder, um, I mean, you've, you've alluded to it already in, in talking about Bill Burns's role uh, and Jake Sullivan and others like Penny Talwar. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how the kind of formal front channel multilateral negotiations between an Iran, Iran and the P5 plus one were happening in places like Baghdad and, and elsewhere in my recollection. Um, uh, Kazakhstan, I think uh, there were meetings there, all the, all the, all the garden spots. Uh, and then there was this, this secret back channel um, uh, that, ar that arose, if I recall right, because of some interactions between the Sultan of Oman and John Kerry when he was still in the Senate. And that opened up the possibility for Bill and Jake and Puneet and others to have quiet conversations, uh, bilateral ones, so quiet that our allies and partners in the region didn't know about it. And when they found out about it, gave us a lot of grief about it. But how did those two channels interact? Uh, this kind of front channel with, you know, where you still had Ahmadinejad as president and Jalili, I believe, as the, mm -hmm. as the lead negotiator for mm -hmm. Iran, hardline guys. Who was, who, who, what was that conversation like? And then what was the Oman channel like? And were those different actors in, in different conversations? Uh, so the 
uh, channel with uh, Jalili, who led the negotiations for the first two years of uh, the four years that I did this, um, was a very staid uh, P5 plus one uh, exercise. Uh, the Iranians spoke in Farsi, we spoke in English, everybody had their set pieces, we traipsed around the world twice to Almaty, once to Baghdad where we got stuck in a sandstorm, uh, Moscow, uh, Helga Schmidt who was First, Kathy Ashton, the high representative of the European Union's uh, deputy, would spend weeks on the phone with Ali Bagheri, uh, Jalili's uh, political director, uh, deciding on where we would meet. E even the place we would meet was a torturous, torturous negotiation. Um, those almost two years were valuable, though, because the P5 plus one got to know each other very well. And we got to know what each other's needs were and interests were. and who did best at night and who had to have a break for a cigarette. Um, all, of the, all of these things which are important to understanding the rhythm of a negotiation and how a team is going to work together. Uh, but they were fairly uh, hopeless uh, negotiations. And um, at that point, Bob Einhorn was the lead on our side. And Bob was also part of uh, first Puneet and Jake who went on the initial trip to Oman because of a relationship that John Kerry, then chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had developed with the Sultan of Oman, who had helped the hikers who had been taken by the Iranians. And actually, Oman paid the bail uh, for the bail uh, for the hikers to get back to America. Uh, and um, uh, Puneet and uh, Jake thought there was some possibility here. So the president then asked Bill to lead this secret channel with Jake and a small team, Puneet part of it. Uh, but they too uh, had a torturous uh, undertaking while Ahmadinejad was president. When Rouhani was elected, he was shocked to find out that a secret channel had happened under Ahmadinejad. I mean, you can imagine who would have expected Ahmadinejad to have count, you know, allowed uh, such a channel. Uh, the channel had gotten so nowhere that Bob Einhorn decided to leave government uh, because he thought this was going nowhere. Uh, he was done with it. Uh, he wanted to do other things in his life. So he left government. But then Rouhani was elected. And President Obama made a very critical decision. And the decision was to allow Bill to say to the Iranians that if they would be open to quite intrusive monitoring and verification. President Obama might consider a very small limited enrichment program for civil nuclear purposes. That was a monumental decision uh, by the president uh, because it opened the door to a possibility which had not previously existed. Every time Bill had a round, uh, his chief of staff would walk down an envelope to mine hand it to me afterwards. Uh, so I always knew what was going on in that channel, agreed to the talking points, which were part of the policy process with a small group at the White House, uh, and joined that secret channel towards the end of it so I would get to know the characters, uh, because I was going to have the delightful um, responsibility of letting my colleagues know about the secret channel, one of the great days of my life. Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, that channel negotiated a draft interim agreement that was going to stop Iran's program long enough, six months was expected, for us to complete a final agreement. It took us nearly 18 months, <laughs> not six months, to get to that final agreement. And I was going to bring that document into the P5 plus one with brackets. Uh, two weeks in advance of a meeting of ministers in Geneva where we hope to bring it to closure. Um, this couple of strange notes and then uh, we can go on from there. Um, Abbas Arachi uh, was the second in command in the secret channel. Majid Ravanchi was the lead because Majid Ravanchi had responsibility in their system for the United States, for the bilateral relationship. When it moved into the P5 plus one, Abbas Arachi, 
who did international, uh, took over as the lead. Abbas had been part of Jalili's team, but we never paid any attention to him because we didn't know he spoke perfect English and wrote in perfect English and knew every detail of everything. So it was really extraordinary when we moved into the new uh, chapter with Zarif as the taking over from Jalili and Abbas taking over from Bagheri. We were in a whole different realm. All of the negotiations, all of the writing was conducted in English, which made an extraordinary difference to how we proceeded. Hmm. So you mentioned it, um, you know, this, this momentous decision after Rouhani's election uh, by President Obama to at least envision an agreement that would trade highly in long-term commitments by, the, by Iran and intrusive inspections for some limited enrichment capacity, something the Iranians have been demanding for forever. Um, and our partners and our were partners. for. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people, I mean, you know this, obviously, but I think a lot of people don't realize that there was a version, actually, of what we call the Iran deal that was on the table in 2005 uh, that the Bush administration had rejected because of their, because of their insistence on zero enrichment right. for forever, right. which is a, it is a meaningful historical anecdote as we think about how likely yep. the Trump administration's policy is going to be to succeed. But I wonder what, uh, can you say anything about kind of the president's calculation? I mean, we, we were in a lot of meetings together later. I wasn't privy to that one. Later where Obama um, uh, was making trade-offs between capacity and transparency all the time. But can you say a little bit yeah. more about his decision? So uh, negotiations and decisions like this are always considered through alternatives. So what were the alternatives? One alternative was to bomb the facilities in Iran. And indeed, President Obama commissioned and deployed uh, a new weapon that could penetrate the one secret underground facility, Fordo, uh, to say to the Iranians, if we have to take military action, we're ready. And quite frankly, in part to deter Israel from taking military action, because we did not want them to precipitously do so. Uh, but it was a serious effort on the president's part. And people tend to think of negotiations as what happens in the room, but setting the table and all of the other elements around the negotiations are equally, if not more important, to the success of a negotiation. So our military posture having this capability was ex ex extraordinarily important. So the president knew that you can bomb facilities, but you can't bomb away knowledge. And the Iranians knew how to do what they knew how to do. So if we bomb the facilities, even those who wanted to bomb knew that within three to five years, Iran could recreate those facilities and would likely do so underground and in secret. Uh, so it didn't look like it was a very attractive alternative. And a last resort alternative for sure, for which we had to be ready, and we were. Uh, we rearrayed our forces in the Persian Gulf to show our seriousness, because we were serious. Uh, the president could have decided to just keep piling on sanctions and squeezing Iran. But he understood that sanctions don't necessarily change bad behavior. They're used as a tool to get people to the negotiating table. When the Europeans were negotiating in 2005, 2006, Iran had 164 centrifuges. By the time we got serious, really serious, into the deep negotiations in 2013, with the most extensive sanctions, including secondary economic sanctions, full oil embargo, you, you name it, we'd thrown it on the table, Iran had 19,000 centrifuges. So the president understood that sanctions wouldn't stop them from doing what they were doing necessarily. And uh, it also uh, were fraying a bit because we had asked countries like Korea and Japan to forego oil uh, from Iran. We'd help them get new oil contracts. We sent teams all around the world getting oil producers to increase capacity and help uh, decide on new contracts for countries. But nonetheless, it was a real challenge. We were asking countries to take economic hurt. Our secondary economic sanctions cut off uh, Iran's huge middle class uh, from any investors. Uh, so there was a lot at stake here, and it was hard to hold it together even as good a job as I think we did. So the president calculated that if he really wanted to ensure that Iran would never get a nuclear weapon, 
he would probably have to test negotiations. And he understood that it was not likely to get anywhere without putting this possibility on the table. And again, appreciating that Iran could not unlearn what it knew. It had mastered the entire nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, and so he made this very uh, important uh, decision, uh, which of course is now under siege once again. So you talked a little bit about uh, Obama's decision making on this, and I want to come back to that in, in, a, in a minute, um, especially to kind of pull apart a little bit some of the Trump administration's critique of, mm -hmm. of the deal. But I, I want to come back to Iran for just a second. And, and you know, I think that there's a tendency among a lot of American politicians and even uh, some analysts uh, to treat Iran as a monolithic Absolutely. political entity. Um, you obviously had experiences dealing with actual Iranians, not figments of our collective imagination that appear on, as pundits write things or talk on TV. Um, how did you, you know, how did you see the real politics of Iran changing the nature of the negotiation? Besides the English piece, which I, I actually is not a trivial point, if any of you have sat through simultaneous <laughs> or sequential translation in these types of things. Um, but, but, you know, how did people like Rouhani and Zarif had have their own different mindset? I mean, I don't think we should pretend that these guys are moderates or liberals no. in a Western sense, but as it relates to Iran's political spectrum, um, they're not Jalili, they're not Ahmadinejad, uh, they're not Qasem Soleimani or Ali Khamenei. Uh, so how did that, you know, how did, how did Rouhani and, Rouhani's worldview differ, uh, his, prior, his national priorities differ, and how did that open some space for you all? Sure. So I, I agree with you, uh, Colin. I call Rouhani a hardliner, and I called Qasem Soleimani a hard hardliner, uh, because I, I think it's n naive on our part to think of Rouhani as a moderate in Western terms. He's not. He is a very conservative cleric. He wants to survive uh, in a regime. But I also quite agree with you. Iran is not a monolith. People tend to think it has a supreme leader, so he must decide everything. But there are real politics in Iran, which showed themselves constantly during this negotiation. Uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Quds Force, Qasem Soleimani's uh, outfit, uh, never wanted this deal. They owned the black market because of the sanctions. They owned a lot of Iranian, Iran's economy. Uh, they didn't want the deal. They thought they had the best of all possible worlds. They could do whatever bad behavior they wanted to do in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, control the economic levers of Iran. Uh, Rouhani was elected uh, on the basis of really responding to the vast majority of Iranians. Uh, most are uh, under the age of 30 or 35. Um, they are all on the internet in spite of censorship. They can see how other people live. At that point, they looked particularly at Turkey and saw, you know, people could do normal things. And so why couldn't they have a normal life? Uh, and Rouhani understood that if he didn't loosen sanctions, then the Green Revolution of 2009 might turn into a real revolution uh, later on, and that he had to respond to this economic need uh, to become a more modern economic society, uh, and to try to pull back some of the economic levers that the IRGC owned. Uh, the modulus, which is Iran's version of a parliament, uh, actually does have some power in Iran's system, uh, can and does impeach ministers, not just presidents, on a regular basis, um, could call Zarif down, which they did on, on a regular basis, to confront him about what he was doing. Um, at one point in, the, in this process uh, in Luzon, we came to agreement on the parameters of a final deal. We were all ecstatic. Uh, we got much further than anybody in the world or the press thought we would. Uh, the White House, as you know, was insistent that we make public those parameters because they wanted nobody to be able to walk them back. Um, we knew that our colleagues wouldn't be very happy about us doing that, but we thought it was the right thing to do. Not only were our colleagues not happy about us doing that, but the Supreme Leader went out almost immediately and gave a speech saying none of this was true. None of these parameters had to have been agreed to. And in fact, here were 10 new red lines uh, for the negotiations. It was a very difficult moment uh, in the process and just reminded us again of how complex the process is because the Supreme Leader is always trying to balance the one step forward for modernity with the IRGC, 
not wanting to lose his position, uh, not wanting to lose the power of death to America, a nationalist call that helps keep the country together. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great point because, so, and sometimes the politics don't make, uh, they, they confound your expectations and assumptions. I mean, I, I don't think we should talk about it very long, but the, you know, the Tehran research reactor deal, which was on the table mm -hmm. prior to you coming to the mm -hmm. State Department, was some, which would have essentially shipped out a bunch of uh, low enriched uranium uh, from Iran in exchange for higher enriched uh, or medium enriched, it's not a technical term, but essentially medium enriched, enriched uranium they could use for their uh, medical research reactor uh, near Tehran um, and had been supported by Ahmadinejad and Jalili. Uh, and then because it was a political opportunity to criticize them, moderates, uh, and reformers, uh, including uh, Green Movement uh, uh, leaders, criticized the capitulation of Ahmadinejad to make uh, to make uh, some hay politically. So I think, you know, politics in Iran is something we sh we shouldn't discount. And I I feel like that right now the discourse has shifted back towards yeah. the, viewing them as a monolithic thing. Um, speaking of that uh, discourse, so uh, you you might have seen uh, Secretary Pompeo had a had a has a brand new article in Foreign Affairs. Um, you had yours last last issue. Yeah. Now he gets his. Um, uh, most of the most of the art it's it's about both North Korea and Iran, but most of it is about uh, Iran, uh, and he kind of reiterates their criticism of of the deal and lays out what their strategy uh, is, uh, and essentially their critique boils down to the fact that you know the deal that uh, the Obama administration negotiated that you had a lead role in is a terrible deal. Uh, the president has said that repeatedly, and by terrible they mean it doesn't put permanent constraints on Iran's. Uh, civilian uh, uh, enrichment capabilities in particular. Uh, some of those constraints lapse at years 10 and 15 of the deal. It does nothing to deal with Iran's ballistic missiles, uh, which could be delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons down the road. And it does nothing to deal with Iran's support for terrorism, its support for militancy, its anti-Israel posture, its human rights abuses. And therefore, it needs to be thrown aside we need to reimpose pressure and drive towards the better deal. So I guess the question I have is, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> we did think of that. <laughs> so um, the president made a decision that the most serious challenge was to ensure that Iran never got a nuclear weapon. And that if he tried to include in the deal all of these other behaviors, we would negotiate against ourselves. So Iran would say, OK, we'll give Hezbollah a little less money so they can't launch as many rockets into Israel, but we want more centrifuges as a result. Or we want IR-5s instead of IR-1s to remain. Uh, and so we thought we'd be negotiating against ourselves. Secondly, the Gulf states said uh, to me at the get-go, it's fine for you to negotiate a nuclear deal, but don't you discuss anything in the region because we're not in the room. As the deal appeared to be getting done, the Gulf states said to me, well, how could you possibly negotiate a nuclear deal without including everything else that's going on in the region? <laughs> so, um, which I understand from a political point of view, uh, why they said that the way they did. Um, I think the president made the right decision. Uh, you can't do everything all at once, and quite frankly, the Iranians wouldn't do everything all at once, but even if they wanted to, I believe we would have been negotiating against ourselves and we would have ended up at the mediocre middle on all issues. Um, we, the president said we needed to close down all of the pathways to fissile material, uh, highly enriched uranium, weapons grade plutonium, and covert supply chain, which we did. And yes, restrictions come off at 10 years, at 15 years, quite frankly, at 20 years, at 25 years, uh, because of uranium accountancy and uh, because of a uh, uh, eyes on uh, rotors and bellows in centrifuges. Um, and Iran commits to never having a nuclear weapon. Uh, and if Iran had a nuclear weapon, they'd be able to deter anything we'd want to do in the Middle East. So they really are an incredibly critical element here. Um, and of course, the additional protocol would be in place forever, which is a commitment to ever having a nuclear weapon. I think all of us perceived that down the road, there would probably be a follow-on arms control agreement, because there usually is an arms control agreement. Uh, I think that we saw that if we could get this deal done, it had opened a channel of communication with the Iranians. And although that didn't mean we would be able to solve these other problems, we'd at least have a channel for attempting 
to solve these other problems. And although Zarif could not officially discuss any of these issues, uh, whether it's Syria or Israel or anything else, um, there was conversation. Uh, and the one negotiation we did have in parallel uh, was a humanitarian channel, which was just between the United States and Iran. And it was me, uh, first Brooke Anderson, and then Rob Malley, who acted as my deputies, uh, with Abbas Arachi and Majid Ravanchi. And every time we met, we had a separate meeting uh, to try to get Americans out of Evan prison and back home and to find out what happened to Robert Levinson. That set of discussions ultimately led to us setting up a separate team uh, that, and Iran, for the first time, brought an interagency group together. I said we could not have these discussions. We would be interagency, and we would not have the discussions unless Iran was interagency. Uh, their team was headed up by someone from their intelligence community. Uh, and uh, that ended up uh, achieving uh, some Americans coming home. We still don't know. Uh, about Robert Levinson, and there remain some Americans in Evan Prison, but it was uh, the only thing we did at the same time. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, it's interesting. I think much has been made about the sunset provisions. Mm -hmm. my, my own sense was that, um, you know, essentially Iran would have had an interval, a, dec a decade plus, to demonstrate to the world that their intentions about their nuclear program were truly right. peaceful. And if they didn't, then at years 12 or 13 or whatever of the deal, we'd start the thing up again exactly. with international support if Iran hadn't demonstrated exactly. that. What, what is odd about Trump's approach is that they envisioned this crisis happening in 2030 and decided to have it in 2018, which is, a, which is without any international support. Which, yes. uh, which <laughs> with, with 12 reports from the International Atomic Energy Agency saying Iran was in complete compliance. Not that there weren't some issues along the way. There were. But there was a process to deal with those issues, and the process worked. Yeah, and I think that... So I, this is actually, a, 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 you know, so Trump withdraws from the agreement uh, in, in May. Um, they threaten to reimpose sanctions. That happens in two phases. The first phase happened in August. The really big ones are going to come down the uh, pike in a couple of weeks uh, in November when the crippling banking and energy sanctions go back into place. Um, uh, the Trump administration claims that they want to use this pressure, this maximum pressure campaign, to drive the Iranians back to the table to negotiate a better deal along the lines that corrects all these errors of, uh, that, they, that they point to in the Obama uh, approach. Um, so where do you think, see things headed? You know, we're on the cusp of the reimposition of sanctions. Uh, do you, you think it'll work? Um, first of all, I hope, um, though I expect he hasn't, I hope the president reads the 110 pages of the agreement. Uh, Secretary Mattis, who was not a supporter of this agreement, has read it more than once and uh, has said that um, he thinks it would have been better for us to stay rather than leave, that in fact uh, the IRGC has done more, uh, not less, since, not just because they've gotten a little bump up in budget, but because they feel free to go back to what they were doing before we had a deal. Uh, so um, I'm very concerned about what the president has done. I think he did it because he said in the campaign it was the worst deal ever and he was going to rip it up. And although I didn't agree with Secretary Tillerson on much, I think he and uh, General McMaster probably held the president in the deal. And when they left, all bets were off. Uh, I think, you know, as painful as it was for me, for President Obama, for Secretary Kerry, Moniz, all the team, all of us who worked on this, the real pain is I think it makes us less secure. Uh, and puts uh, U.S. at risk. Um, I think that um, most company, large companies have already left uh, because they anticipated the November sanctions and the secondary economic sanctions mean if you do business with the Central Bank of Iran, you can't do business with American banks. And if you're Siemens or Total, you sort of care about the U.S. market more. Uh, and so they've left already. The Europeans have set up a special purpose vehicle trying to help small and medium enterprises get around dollar-denominated transactions uh, to stay in. Not clear whether that will work. I think the Iranians, and I do see Zarif and Abbas whenever they come to New York, in spite of Secretary Pompeo saying, those of us who do that are traitors to our country, um, because I want them to not get a nuclear weapon and I want them to stop what they're doing in uh, the Middle East and I want them to return Americans home. Um, so I think the Iranians will watch our politics. Uh, 
If it looks like they're going to change, they'll try to hold out. If it looks like we're in for a very long haul, I think they're going to find their way back to a negotiation table with the Trump administration. That would be in our interest, quite frankly, uh, because the current situation is not sustainable for the long haul. Uh, and I don't want the IRGC to get complete upper hand. I don't want Rouhani, the hardliners, to be uh, voted out. And we have the hard hardliners again, uh, because that will be quite impossible. Um, I think that um, the pressure certainly works, but the Europeans are trying very hard uh, to do that. And I think it has some consequences that the administration's not thinking about. Uh, we have really thrown the Europeans into Russia and China's arms. Uh, that has long-term consequences. Uh, I think our, uh, what the president has done uh, to really push the transatlantic relationship out of the picture uh, has consequences because people will go look for other partners. Uh, and it isolates us, not Iran and everyone else. Uh, I know we'll get to talk about um, Jamal Khashoggi and uh, what is going on right now. But it has, uh, as you notice, Iran's been rather quiet because it's smart of them to be quiet. Saudi Arabia has taken a big hit, and that only helps Iran. So what the heck are we doing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very odd because, of course, Trump in October of 2017 said essentially he was going to trash the deal unless the Europeans came to the table and negotiated a side agreement that would fix the flaws. Which, which they, they did. Which they essentially did. Uh, right. they, nego they, they got about 80% of what the, of what Trump asked for. Uh, he could have spiked the football and declared victory uh, uh, on it. But instead, in May, he exits the deal. And so, uh, you know, we find the Europeans uh, and the Chinese looking for ways to circumvent the U.S. banking system uh, to continue transactions with Iran. There's reporting to suggest the Russians may try to help the Iranians get oil to global markets through a barter system where it all gets shipped to Russia and exchange for certain goods. I, I think goes, that will happen, actually. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the irony is that it's meant to isolate Iran. I'm not sure it's having that effect. I, 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 I guess that, and maybe this will be the last question and we'll go to the audience, um, what do you think the broader consequences are? Uh, you've talked a little bit about the transatlantic relationship. Uh, but what are the broader consequences of Trump's Iran strategy uh, in, in general for the region, for the globe? And you, you mentioned Jamal Khashoggi. A big part of the Trump administration's policy succeeding relies on you know, giving Saudi Arabia a blank check, having Saudi Arabia help in uh, uh, sanctions enforcement and, and keeping oil prices low as Iran's oil comes off the market. So it's really, it's really wedded them quite closely to the Saudis. I think they were there anyway, but, it's, but their policy has gotten them any closer. But so how, how, how is this playing out beyond the, the Iran deal in a vacuum? I think there are tons of consequences. One of the things that you probably remember, Colin, is Jack Lew, when he was Secretary of Treasury, reminded us all that our secondary economic sanctions are really powerful. But if we use them too often, and we're trying to use them with North Korea, which matters a little less because we don't have trade with North Korea, and most people don't except for China, uh, that the rest of the world would begin to say, well, the dollar shouldn't be the reserve currency of the world. Uh, oil is traded in dollars. Maybe we should take a look at that. And we would be undermining our economic power if people go to a basket of currencies or take the dollar out of that basket. It would have profound economic consequences going forward. Uh, so I think we need to be concerned about that. Um, I think that even though uh, the administration's tried to keep oil prices low, you may notice they have gone rather high. Uh, and um, Russia, uh, and Mike certainly could speak to this, is absolutely ecstatic uh, because the ruble is in the tank, uh, but oil prices are high. That's good for them. They don't need to deal with us, uh, and uh, it helps Putin enormously. So we are helping Putin in that regard. Uh, not only the transatlantic relationship, but Korea, Japan, which has had a long established relationship with Iran, uh, are going to juggle uh, what they do. India, uh, which is an enormous consumer of Iranian oil, uh, has an election coming up. Uh, although um, Modi wants to cooperate with the U.S., it's an important partner. We're both democracies. Uh, I know that he's taken a look at whether how hard they're going to go at reducing their level of Iranian oil because he needs to keep 
price is low and energy is subsidized by the government. It's a huge issue in India. Uh, so that has profound implications for us in terms of where Modi ends up in this. Uh, we, of course, are under undermining the international system uh, and the United Nations system. This wasn't just a deal between the U.S. and Iran. It was an international deal. As you noted, it was approved 15 to 0 by the U.N. Security Council. But then again, uh, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, believes that the top 10 floors of the U.N. should have been taken off anyway. Uh, and so this is sort of consistent uh, with where they are. And then finally, on Khashoggi, the, the administrator, I mean, I sort of feel a little bit for Secretary Pompeo. Clearly, his instructions on going to Saudi Arabia were keep the relationship great, no matter what, at all costs, uh, likely for some of the reasons you've just laid out. And so, you know, he could have gone into the meeting with the crown prince, and I've worked with Saudi Arabia. We've done business with Saudi Arabia. I'm an international business consultant. I care about our relationship with Saudi Arabia for security reasons. All of, all of that. That said, a cold-blooded murder of a journalist is a very serious, serious matter. And uh, he could have gone into the meeting with the crown prince without a grin on his face, without small talk about jet lag, uh, saying that he was there to get the facts, uh, to have a forthright discussion. Uh, he could have left that meeting and said, we are going to get the facts of this case. I don't know them all today, uh, but we're going to. This is an intolerable uh, murder that has taken place. Uh, he could have handled this very differently because his audience is not just the President of the United States. His audience is the world, the American public, the Congress, uh, and this is a cold-blooded murder. I do not hold President Trump responsible for the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, but I do hold him responsible for the environment of impunity uh, that has been created uh, when he says that the press is the enemy of the people, which is a Stalin uh, term, uh, when he says everything is fake news, and I think that's a fake concept. Um, I think there is disinformation, but I do not think there is fake news, if it is news. Uh, and um, that atmosphere of impunity gives license to autocrats uh, to do whatever it is they want to do, and I don't think that's who we are. Uh, all right. Well, on that um, note, we, uh, we I think we should thank Wendy. Um, but we're not we're not done yet. Uh, uh, Mackenzie uh, Burnett, my, my RA back there, has a microphone. Um, and so uh, I'll just kind of call on people. Uh, maybe, uh, Mackenzie, you can come this way, so I think you might be on the camera's line. Um, so who would like to, uh, Alan, please. Uh, wait for the mic just so we can pick it up over here, if that's all right. No, no, no. <laughs> Camera is not set for teaching voice. <laughs> Sorry, she was right. She's coming. Right. Making her way. All right. And if everybody could briefly introduce themselves, uh, make their questions brief, make them questions, not comments, uh, we'll be good. Yeah. I'm Alan Weiner. I'm from the law school. Ambassador Sherman, it's, uh, thank you very much for coming. It's great to see you again. Um, you noted in your comments um, that uh, in the choice about the Iran deal, there was a choice between taking on just the nuclear issue and the other malign activities. That was one choice that had to be made, and also the temporal um, Point. In your comments, though, you said that the President decided the goal was to ensure that Iran would never have a nuclear program, and yet we accepted the temporal uh, limits. Uh, of course, we would not have been comfortable with where we might end up after the agreement with Iran having a pledge not to develop a nuclear weapon, which it has already made under the NPT, and even uh, the additional protocol. We insisted on much more robust, intrusive restrictions on its nuclear program because those things were not enough. So I'm wondering what we thought would happen after 10 years or 15 years? Um, did we think that there would be a political change in Iran, a regime change? Did we think that there would be a change in the strategic calculus uh, on the part of the Iranian government about whether it had any interest in pursuing a nuclear program? Or did we just decide, you know, a permanent uh, restriction is too hard and we'll take half a loaf? Well, um, I think it's a little more than half a loaf. 
I should say for the record, I'm a big supporter, and I'm on record as having said I'm a strong supporter of the JCPOA. I think it's actually more than half a loaf because the restrictions, uh, as I said, go for 20 and 25 years. Certainly for 15 years, it's pretty darn solid because uh, they can only have um, 300 kilograms of enriched uranium at 3.67 percent, and SIG could tell us better than I can that you really can't get a nuclear weapon at those levels. Uh, and even the technical folks, the IDF, uh, the community in Israel said for at least a decade Israel was safer. I think our view was two things, Alan. One, that uh, we needed a, a track record of compliance, uh, that there would, as in all arms control uh, deals, likely a follow-on agreement uh, once we saw that in fact there could be compliance. Two, that every tool we had in our toolbox we still had. We could throw sanctions back on uh, unilaterally, even at the UN, because we put in this agreement a rather odd uh, way to get a UN Security Council uh, assessment to slap back multilateral sanctions. Um, and quite frankly, Sergei Lavrov uh, helped figure out that ingenious mechanism, uh, because he knows the UN probably better than anybody else at the table. Um, we uh, thought that besides that follow-on agreement that was most likely, uh, that uh, we didn't expect that Iran would change its stripes overnight. I, I know lots of people say that was the hope. Nobody, I, I certainly never said publicly that I thought that's what was going to happen. We have no idea. Change takes a long time in systems. Uh, We've been really lousy at regime change. I, I believe the administration's policy is soft regime change at the moment, uh, that they think they can put so much pressure on that people will rise up and change the theocracy of Iran. I think that's unlikely to happen. And if it does, there's an assumption it will be replaced by something better. And uh, we've, we've been to that movie. Uh, it's never ended well uh, in the ways that we might hope. Uh, I thought it was better to, in fact, have European investors, even Boeing, uh, inside of Iran, uh, talking with Iranian citizens and trying to create change in that way. Um, but we will never, we'll never know. We'll never know. So I don't think we bet. I didn't bet on a change. I did bet on years of compliance that would increase our ability to have a follow-on agreement as needed. But I also believed that we were probably uh, safer for at least 20 or 25 years, not 10. Mike. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So uh, Mike McFall, Stanford. Um, um, can you take us a little bit into, you hinted at the domestic politics in Iran, <sighs> and if you could go into more of that, that'd be great, but I only get one question, so that's not my question. Um, my question is actually about the domestic politics within our administration, within the Obama administration, and even if you want to talk about the, the external piece as well. And in particular, you know, there's an interagency process, you guys hinted at it. What were some of the cleavages? What were some of the hard issues there uh, before you got- One question. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's all one question. Um, and, and a little bit about just the mechanics of that negotiation, right? I worked on the START Treaty, and I, re I remember how we had our folks in Geneva, and then we had the interagency back home, and pulling on the negotiators not to go too far. Tell us, just get a, let us in a little bit to the extent you want to, to talk about those dynamics. Um, I think we had a phenomenal policy process, and I think it was phenomenal starting from the top. The president was very clear about what he wanted to do. He learned all the details. I've learned along the way that when the leader knows the details, you have a much better chance, which sort of tells us something about where we are right now. Um, you know, when I was doing North Korea, and Bill, doing it with Bill first and then doing it after he stepped away, uh, when Madeleine Albright and I met with Kim Jong-il, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un's father, he actually knew the details of the missile negotiation we were undertaking, which gave us some sense that we might actually be able to accomplish something. Uh, and that was true of President Obama. So uh, at, towards the end of the negotiation, we would have civets, secure civets, from Vienna, usually at 3 in the morning because of the time difference, uh, with the president. And he was very decisive because he was very knowledgeable. Uh, and 
Uh, he had come to those decisions after a very, very intense and deep internal policy process. We had the deputies committee meetings and the principals committee meetings to go over the big decisions, but we also had a small group of people who were living this day to day uh, that met on a constant basis. Um, we had hundreds of people in the U.S. government involved in this. The labs were extraordinarily helpful. Everything that we did, we ran through the labs, just like we ran through Israel's bureaucracy, uh, the details of what we were doing, because we wanted their technical expertise as well. At the end of the negotiation, the labs had teams on 24-7 because of the time difference with Vienna, uh, their best teams, so we could get instantaneous calculations because this is a very technical undertaking. Um, I would say that uh, there were differences and debates in the administration for sure, but I never felt them as uh, big gulfs, uh, in part because the president was decisive uh, about what to do and he knew what he wanted to try to achieve. The Congress was another matter. We did over 200 briefings with the Congress, most of them in secure settings. Uh, I give the Congress credit. They actually came, listened. I don't think many of them ever read the deal. Uh, and the day the deal was done, uh, every single Republican uh, came out against the deal. They couldn't have read it because they didn't have it yet. Uh, but they all came out against the deal. It was politics leading up to the presidential campaign. Uh, it was painful politics. Uh, after um, uh, John Boehner, uh, as you well know, um, invited uh, Bibi Netanyahu to address a joint session of Congress without uh, telling the White House, uh, Bibi came to denounce what we were doing in the Iran deal. That was followed by Senator Tom Cotton uh, getting 47 Republican senators to send a letter to the leadership in Iran saying um, that this would only pertain for this administration, and they shouldn't think this had any long-term uh, possibility at all. Uh, all of this was very tough, though nothing is um, lost as an opportunity in a negotiation. Uh, so when the Iranians would say to me, our modulus is really difficult, you don't know what we have to put up with, I'd say, excuse me? <laughs> you see this letter from 47 senators? You aren't the only victim here, so are we. You know, give a little. Uh, so uh, you have to use every tool you have and every opportunity you have. But it was, I don't know if you want to add anything, because Colin was very much part of the policy process, um, even though he wasn't inside the room. He might as well have been. Yeah, I, I mean, in my, I mean, I wasn't at the White House from the beginning through the end. I was just there for the two and a half years at the, at the end. I was at the Defense Department at the, at the beginning, overseeing some of the setting the table stuff that Wendy talked about earlier. Um, in, in the two and a half years that, that I was at the White House, this was, this, this was by far the best interagency process we ran on any national security issue. Um, I think there were some pretty effective responses to crises, like what we did vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ebola in the fall of, 20, of 2014. Uh, and I think the counter-ISIS uh, stuff went pretty well, too. But this, which had been this long play from the beginning of the Obama administration, culminating at the end, something the president was deeply invested in and knowledgeable on, was the best process. I, I, I you know... My sense was there was, there was none of the high-level drama among the principals that you sometimes see, I think in large part because the president's position was clear, but also because Secretary Kerry and Secretary Moniz were at the table, and were at the table, and you know, there might be marginal disagreements with Jack Lew or whatever, uh, but nothing compared to some of the disagreements we had on issues like Syria, for example. The, the disagreements were really about detail. Should we allow any non-operational centrifuges to exist at Fordo as a face-saving measure? Should we allow the R&D uh, portions of the agreement to be described in this way or that way, kind of how the inspections would go. But these were about details, not about the broad contours of the agreement, which I, I think everybody was kind of rowing in the same uh, direction at 24-7, uh, and it was pretty, it was a pretty remarkable uh, uh, thing. Um, anyway, so I, I, it was, it was One other thing I would say, and I have said this uh, to some of the folks who are working as envoys and negotiators for President Trump. I always knew the president would have my back, as with Secretary Kerry and Secretary Moniz. We were a team. And I was given tremendous authority uh, within the parameters the president set out. I never worried that the rug would be pulled out from under me. 
Secretary Pompeo, uh, Steve Began uh, on North Korea can never be sure that will be the case. And that is very hard when you're a negotiator. Hi, Ariel Petrovich. I'm a graduate or student registrar at uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and um, a PhD candidate at UC Davis. Uh, first, thank you very much for coming in and sharing these comments. These are um, really elucidating. They sort of add a little bit more depth from what we can get just from the pages of the book. Um, so I wanted to sort of look a little bit more forward rather than back at what you know the deal had already accomplished now that we know that we sort of face a, an even harder mm -hmm. uh, challenge, um, now that we probably have two uh, foes that we need to face on this. And you had mentioned that um, sanctions often have these perverse effects. So what do you suggest as um, a good tactic for bringing an adversary to the negotiating table that doesn't necessarily empower the hard hardliners um, the way that these sanctions sometimes do, um, and might even perhaps empower the like first order hardliners um, like like Rouhani's team um, and obviously the implications here are not just Iran maybe there's there's North Korean implications as well thank you I, I don't think there's one tool in the toolbox that fixes everything I think you have to use all of the tools in the toolbox so I think sanctions are an effective tool to get someone to the negotiating table because it sharpens the choice that you're making at the same time you have to you know uh, the threat of force in service of diplomacy is critical. Uh, and so setting the military table was very critical to what we did. Setting up virtual embassy Tehran, which we did online, so we could talk directly to Iranian citizens and they had a place to get information when they could get through the barriers was important. Public diplomacy was crucial. Public diplomacy worked in both directions. It was very crucial to help and when I very stupidly at a hearing um, in the Senate uh, in answer to a question said deception was in their DNA, speaking of Iranians, not only did I make Iranian Americans really pissed off at me, uh, but uh, I ended up having people in the streets of Tehran saying death to Wendy Sherman, which really delighted my family. So uh, you uh, need to use that public diplomacy but understand the power that it can have for good and for ill. Uh, so those comments matter. We are in a very different age, and I didn't talk about this much in the book, but the Iranians would tweet out from the negotiating room. So we would leave from the negotiations with the press coming at me about one thing or another because they'd gotten a tweet from the Iranians. Uh, and even though Twitter is not allowed in Iran, uh, as I've said to Minister Zarif, you use really, make really good use of it, so why don't you just make it legal um, in, in uh, Iran? Um, all disclosure, I've done some work for Twitter, or my company has, so um, I'm all for it. Um, so I think you have to use every single tool in the toolbox to set the table and to try to move towards negotiations as well as negotiations. I say, and I don't mean it jokingly at all, I negotiated inside of the administration. I negotiated with Congress. I negotiated with every member of the P5 plus one in the European Union bilaterally and as a group. I negotiated with Israel before and after every single session. I negotiated with the Gulf states before and after every session. I negotiated with think tanks, academics, and NGOs in our own country. Uh, and yeah, occasionally I negotiated with Iran. <laughs> it, it is an incredibly complex process and, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I did this while I was the undersecretary and traveled to 54 other countries um, besides Vienna, which I consider a country since I spent so much time there, um, 54 other countries, some of them multiple times. So, and we were, did Syria negotiations at the same time, did the chemical weapons agreement, um, lots, lots of moving pieces. And they all interact. They all interact. I mean, if you just if you think of what what happened diplomatically when Wendy was was there, right? Not only the Iran negotiations, holding together the counter ISIS coalition, the Paris Climate Accord, finalizing the Trans Pacific, Pacific Partnership, opening to Cuba, the Colombia peace stuff. Like there was a lot going on. Uh, so uh, it's not tooting your own horn. It was an extraordinarily uh, uh, um, dynamic time. Uh, Sig, you had your hand up uh, a, a minute ago. 
our teacher. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank you so much for a fascinating uh, insights into that whole process. Uh, you know, I I, I want to look at the the time limits, you know, and get you a sense of what's there. But but to set uh, the uh, essentially the pace for that it is in September of 2013. Uh, a couple of colleagues and I had a chance to meet with Sarif and Arangtri and some of their technical people in New York. So that was before you came to the final conclusion. And I was just amazed by uh, their view of what they said they were willing to do. And actually, one of the things that Sarif said, he said, you know, we, we don't want to be looking like we're pursuing nuclear weapons because that's to our disadvantage. So, so I generally felt is what they're doing is they're putting the nuclear weapon option on the back table. And then what you folks did, which was got much farther than anything I had ever assumed, uh, is you, you took that time, you know, what you call the breakout time, much farther than, than I would have thought uh, was possible. But then you still have these uh, time limits out there. And so I guess what could happen then after 10, 15 and so years is they could once again shorten the breakout time, right? And, and you, you knew that, of course. But you know what nobody talks about, in addition to breakout time, there's the issue of breakout price. Mm. You know, in other words, what would they have to pay at various times to break out? And it would seem to me that's where your strategy really comes into play because if in the next 10, 15 years, they and the people of Iran actually start to benefit from all of these things, then if they go and do things to shorten the breakout time, that's gonna cost them. So how, how much did that come into you know, the thinking and, and uh, the negotiations? That was cer certainly part of the thinking, Sig, but again, y you couldn't count on it. You couldn't count on that happening. Uh, and so, uh, yes, there's a theory of the case uh, that it would up the price for them. Uh, and logically, that makes sense. But, you know, as I've said publicly many times, Iran is a resistance culture. And it's death to America has been a rallying call for nationalism in Iran. Most Americans think of Iran in terms of 1979 and the 444 days they held 52 Americans. But Iranians think of 1953, when U.S. intelligence and British intelligence worry that Mossadegh, the uh, democratically elected prime minister, uh, was going to nationalize Shell Oil and so our intelligence communities knocked him off and put in the Shah of Iran, who turned out to be an oppressive leader, uh, bar none. Uh, so th there's no trust here, uh, us to Iran or Iran to us. Uh, and the, uh, the negotiation wasn't done on the basis of trust, perhaps respect. Uh, the Iranians are superb negotiators, really tough. Um, but never trust, and it goes in both directions for, for historical reasons, which are quite deep. And that death to America has been a nationalist war cry that has helped hold Iran together. Uh, and um, so, yes, you're right, theoretically, I just don't know, actually. You know, we have a, a lot of uh, people at CSAC, including a lot of graduate students who do work on various aspects of, of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. I, I do think one aspect of the Iranian debate that has not been done well enough in a scholarly sense is the debate among Iranian elites about how they envision nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. I, I actually think that there is a sizable portion of the Iranian elite, and I would put Rouhani in this category simply because he's written about it, that see mastery of the fuel cycle as a sufficient deterrent. Uh, that is, that a robust, latent capability to develop this on the back end of an attack, if they were ever attacked, or to create some ambiguity in the minds of a potential attacker, might be enough of a strategic deterrent while not isolating them from the rest of the international mm -hmm. community. And, and I'm not saying that, that that's where the supreme leader is or that other leaders are. It's more a call for those who are doing research in this mm -hmm. space to think more with more nuance and complexity about different pathways to proliferation and how they might serve deterrence purposes uh, in the minds of, of leaders like this without bearing some of the costs that SIG 
uh, Sig uh, talked about. All right, I want to get over to here to the to the other side of the of the room and and gentleman right here. Thanks, Mike. Gentleman right here, uh, short sleeves. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm an Iranian, and I followed the work that you've been involved and your team has been involved with in the negotiations. A fundamental difference, and I'd like to get your perspective on this, that when the Iranians refer to their majlis and how much of a difficult time they give them, that majlis is a very, in a very different position than the U.S. Congress sure. and the Senate. Sure. So Iran's policies and, and practice is based on an individual's decision for survival and, as you mentioned, death to America is the underpinning slogan associated with it. In that context, it's really hard to imagine that a negotiation such as this, without the underpinning and support of the US Congress and Senate, that would have resulted in an agreement that could not be undone with a single signature, could have really lasted. And so, in reality, the fact that the Iranians knew that this could be literally undone with a single signature, and you also knew that it could be done with a single signature, really, I think at this point has put the country in a position that it is teetering and it could spell its end much sooner than otherwise. Which country are you talking about? I'm talking about, well, yeah. I mean, the one that, the one that, that has um, lost the value of its currency by 300%, that um, supplies are in really short, uh, that there's some tremendous demand and there's tremendous supply issues. And so the dynamic that is really we're facing for a lot of reasons, because there is no compatibility between values and principles and the policies that, that are um, at play, I think we now have a dynamic that could create a breakthrough. And I think that the, the, the contrast between what you've done and what Trump has pursued, I'm presenting a contrarian view here. Yeah, it's fine. Is, is potentially one that for many Iranians, and I know, um, um, are very supportive of. And that is something that um, I'd like you to comment on. I know that you have very close um, sense of ownership for the agreement, but in if you can step away from it, sure. I think uh, there may be other views uh, that, that uh, really support what is happening. Sure. Uh, two points I want to make. One, uh, just use your question to deal with an issue that comes up all the time. Why was this an executive agreement and not a treaty? And wouldn't a treaty have created a more durable end? And uh, my view about this is countries leave treaties all the time. Uh, we have. We left the ABM treaty. Uh, it doesn't guarantee anything. It may give you a little bit more durability. Uh, secondly, the U.S. Senate hasn't passed a treaty. New START, the extension of New START, people might consider an extension, but that was a follow-on agreement. There has been no uh, treaty as such that has been agreed to by the United States Senate for years. Even Bob Dole, sitting in his wheelchair on the floor of the uh, U.S. Senate, couldn't get the Disabilities Treaty through. Uh, and third, uh, this agreement has a lot of if this then that in it, which is very hard to put into treaty language. So that's why we didn't go for a treaty. Um, your point about whether uh, Trump's strategy could work and create a regime change that was plausible and significant and positive in Iran, I, I can't argue a counterfactual. I have no idea. Uh, my own experience is usually in these situations, good things don't happen. Um, that uh, my own experience is that many Iranians, even the reform Iranians, want the country to have a capability to have a nuclear weapon because it's a, a matter of pride and dignity. Uh, that may have changed over the years so that it's less uh, strong as it once was. Um, so uh, there's no way I can argue fully against your position. Uh, all I can say is that experience teaches us we're very bad at doing this, uh, that we don't know what the unintended consequences will be, uh, that uh, there was another path that was much more in our control 
uh, which is to have the deal, uh, use the channel to uh, try to address some of the other issues of deep concern uh, that I share uh, with uh, everybody, um, and hopefully make some progress in that regard. Uh, so we'll never, we'll never know now. We'll never know. I, I do think it's, you know, I think we all have to be, all of us have to be humble about making predictions yeah, anywhere. Um, as Yogi Berra said, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, but in the Middle East, I think, if, you know, since the Arab Spring, uh, which nobody expected, things could happen. I, I, I do think, though, that it's worth keeping uh, just a couple of additional things in mind. First, as Wendy noted, noted with the, uh, uh, you know, 1953 and Mossadegh, we are still living with the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth level, you know, uh, uh, level consequences of the last time we tried to engineer regime change uh, in, in Iran. Uh, and there is, you know, whether it's Iraq uh, under the Bush administration or Libya under our administration, there are lots of ways to see this go badly. Uh, either a worse regime or an anarchic situation in a country with twice uh, Iraq's population, Afghanistan's topography, and the most ca capable paramilitary forces in the world, that's not exactly an anarchic situation that would be stabilizing, I don't think, uh, for, uh, for the region of the world. So that's not to say, uh, look, I think the regime is odious. I hope it passes away on, uh, uh, sooner rather than later. I think Wendy would be uh, right there with it. Uh, but this is not a situation in which we have fine-tuned controls. And I, I think actually, you know, Mike McFaul and Abbas Milani wrote a piece that they, they took some flack for, but you know, if one was in favor of regime change, there would have been an argument to sticking with the deal. Because one of the reasons why the protests started coming out uh, last December uh, and in January before Trump left the deal uh, was because of dissatisfaction that Rouhani had overpromised and, and underdelivered, and that with the deal in place, all the Iranian people could blame was the regime for its diversion of money, for its mismanagement, et cetera. Now it's a more complicated equation and because all of the turmoil, uh, all of the economic turmoil in Iran can be blamed on, on Donald Trump. Whether that helps opposition members in, in Iran uh, uh, or helps the regime, I think, is, is to be uh, determined. All right, uh, right here we had, uh, right, go ahead. Whoop. Oh. And then, well, and then, and then come the forward. Yeah, go ahead, no, no, go ahead. And then, whoop. Yeah. No, come forward. Come forward. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Chantel Murphy, a postdoc at CSAC. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could um, talk about the role that verification played in the negotiations, especially with newer aspects of the um, Iran's um, technology, especially when it comes to the military dimensions. Um, and were there any kind of tensions or opposition <laughs> about who would handle that, who was going to be best equipped, and how that played out as far as in the final document? Was it kind of, we need to get these things under control and then figure out how to do it, or was it much more back and forth? Uh, there were constant conversations with the International Atomic Energy Agency throughout this process, while at the same time, being careful to leave the IAEA with its independence uh, so that it didn't look like it was just a tool of the United States or of this negotiation. Uh, I think in the end we handled that pretty well, pretty complicated. There are provisions in this agreement that don't exist in any provision, in any agreement anywhere in the world. The IAEA has used new technology in its verification and monitoring the situation, which I think it now hopes to and is using other places. Uh, as well. On military sites, there is a, you know, this, this got to be sort of a slogan used by those who oppose the agreement that we didn't have access to military sites. It's actually not true. Uh, there is a process in this agreement that doesn't exist in any other agreement that allows in no more than 28 days, and you can't erase uh, nuclear testing in 28 days, sort of like you can't erase uh, cold-blooded murder in two weeks. Um, uh, but that um, process uh, would insist upon access to a military site if, in fact, there was a basis for doing so. It didn't even say the basis had to be, you know, uh, court-based evidence, just a basis for doing so. So it was a pretty low bar. Uh, I think that um, uh, we finished the last mile of the additional protocol, which hadn't existed elsewhere. Uh, because a country could always put off that inspection. They couldn't under the terms of this agreement. So this is not to say this agreement is perfect. It's not. 
no, no agreement is, uh, but it was the strongest set of monitoring and verification methods uh, ever employed. And I think I give the IAEA credit. They had to bring on more staff. They had to work with labs uh, around the world, including ours, uh, to figure out how to do some of these things, uh, modeled and even built facilities to try to understand how to do these things. Um, it's been pretty impressive in my view. Uh, Elizabeth. I'm a senior studying international relations. My question is coming back to Rouhani's election in that, as far as I understand it, it wasn't until the last 24 hours that it became apparent that he was going to win as opposed to Kalibov. And I'm just curious to get what uh, the U.S. government's perspective of what negotiations would have looked like with Kalibov, um, mm. what might have looked like uh, planning for that instead of Rouhani's election. It's a good question. I mean, I think we were trying to figure out how to proceed under any circumstances because uh, the stakes were so high. Uh, but I don't know. It's a, it's a good piece of research you should do. <laughs> She's writing her, her honors thesis on, on the subject related to this. So cool. you can ask her yeah. <laughs> in, in a couple months. What do you, what do you think? What do you think? Um, I'll let you <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Yes, sir. And then we'll bounce back to this gentleman. Come on. So, yep. And then we'll come back. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick question about the media. In, Who are you? I'm sorry. My name is Adam Bernstein. I'm a student here, <coughs> um, a journalist as well, actually. Um, the media in Iran, if you could talk a little bit about how much the role they played in uh, shaping opinion about the Iran deal, how much uh, interaction you or anyone on your team may have had with them uh, uh, to influence that opinion, and you know, death to Wendy Sherman aside, uh, the opinion of the most of the people in Iran toward the deal? Great question. Um, interestingly, obviously, the entire Iran team was men, uh, but most of the reporters were women, the Iranian reporters, uh, which made it very interesting. Uh, they loved to stop to talk to me. Um, I was very careful, however, because they are journalists, you know. Um, <laughs> We uh, had, as a member of our core team, Alan Eyre, who, uh, if you all don't know him, you should get to know him. He's a Foreign Service officer, taught himself Farsi, uh, is the per was the Persian spokesperson uh, for, uh, for this negotiation and for the State Department. He spent every day, his sole job was talking with all the reporters, uh, going online and telling me what the Iranian press was saying, uh, not only what was being tweeted out in the room, but what was online, what conversations were happening, uh, where the you know, different uh, sectors of the press were in Iran. Uh, it was a crucial part of the negotiation to understand what was happening, what was being said, how the press was being used. Zarif and Abbas were both incredibly skilled in their ability to use the press. Ours and theirs, Zarif had lived in the, in the U.S. for 30 years. Uh, he knew our press very well. You, any of you who have been up to the United Nations General Assembly know how just superb he is at working every angle of the American press uh, and seeming open and transparent and, you know, uh, just fantastic about what he does. Um, so. The press, very important part of this story. Uh, and our press as well. Uh, they got sick of me saying, um, this is like a Rubik's Cube until the last piece uh, gets into place. Uh, it's not done. They say to me, how close are we? Are we 50% there, 100% there? Where are we? And I'd always say, it's binary. We're either going to get there or we're not. Uh, so, and we tried to do briefings on a regular basis, as did the Iranian press. Uh, we, as uh, things went on, we started to accredit some Iranian press to come to my briefings. I think that was important to do. Um, uh, very, very interesting. I mean, a lot of res good research could be done on what American press did as stories on this, what Iranian press did, uh, how they lined up with each other and, and didn't. Uh, but uh, on the last day, uh, when uh, we had to do one more little thing, 
um, I said to Kerry, actually, we don't because uh, Rouhani had tweeted out that the deal was done. And then he took down the tweet uh, because he had jumped the gun. Uh, but it, it got done nonetheless. If I recall, you, you actually gave uh, members of your team an actual Rubik's Cube that had like Fordo on one side and yes, verification actually, on another. I think there was, I don't remember right, what the One of the were. team members uh, who is from the energy department uh, thought my constant use of the Rubik's Cube was so cute. He had Rubik's mm. Cubes made up with the different elements of the deal on it. There is one of those now in the Diplomacy Center at the State Department as an artifact <laughs> of this. Uh, an artifact of when we did diplomacy? Yes, oh, when we, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the other artifact is uh, that, that many of us on the team have are T-shirts that say uh, Team Silver Fox. Um, <laughs> That was not only because of the color of my hair, but when I made that untoward statement uh, about Iran, uh, they did cartoons of me in Iranian papers as a fox up in a tree. Uh, so we became Team Silver Fox. I think we have time for one last question. I know that uh, we already yanked the, the mic away from you back here, so you get the last one, yeah? Thanks. Um, my name is Michal Nerko. I'm a, a junior faculty fellow here at CSAC. Um, so in reaction to Mr. Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA, Iran brought a case against the US at the ICJ. Um, and I just would like to hear what are your thoughts on this part of Iranian strategy, and also whether you have ever heard about the Treaty of Amity before this case was brought. I had heard of the Treaty of Amity. Um, I think that uh, this was all sort of predictable. Uh, the ICJ uh, ruled in favor of Iran, and uh, the administration um, immediately pulled out of the Treaty of Amity, which goes uh, very far back between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, they uh, have said the ICJ has no jurisdiction over us. Um, this is all part of um, uh, John Bolton's belief that anything that's multilateral uh, that questions U.S. sovereignty uh, shouldn't exist on the face of the earth. Um, and uh, I think it is unfortunate because there are times when this is a useful tool for us. Um, but um, we are where we are, uh, which is unfortunate. Well, uh, everybody, please join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Shervin for a very insightful conversation. Uh, Two quick house cleaning things. Uh, uh, for those of you who will be going to uh, Wendy's talk later today, uh, that will be downstairs in Bechtel at, at 7 p.m. It's oversubscribed, so if you haven't, if you're if you're not in it, then I guess you'll have to watch it online or something. Uh, that the second thing is that um, this is just the first of a series that we plan to do um, uh, continuously. We will probably do about two speakers a quarter. That's the goal. Uh, the next speaker will be in mid-December, and we're going to bring out uh, Amos Yadlin uh, from, uh, from Israel. He's the head of INSS, Terrific. which is the leading national security think tank in Israel. Uh, and he's going to be talking about uh, the changing um, um, alignments in the region as Israel and the Gulf states move closer together, as the competition be among those, uh, between those states and Iran and its, uh, and its uh, uh, allies and, and proxies heats up, and it should be a fascinating conversation. He, he is spectacular. So you so should come. Stay tuned for the announcement on that in December. And uh, once again, thanks, Winnie. That's pretty Thank great. Thank you all. Thank you.